All right, we are officially live. So thanks to everyone that's joining us for the 2019 Booktube SFF Awards. We had a bit of a technical difficulty, but it wouldn't be an award show without one. So I am joined with the rest of the lovely judges for this year, and I will introduce you to all of them if you're not already familiar. You're with me here, Sam from Thoughts on Tomes here on my channel. We also have Chelsea from The Reading Outlaw. Hey guys, that's me. <laughs> we have Thomas from SFF 180. Hey everyone. We have Elena from Elena Reads Books. Hello. We have Connor from Connor O'Brien. Hey. Rachel from Kalinati. Hello. Claire from Claire Russo. Sorry, I forgot how the unmute button works. <laughs> so classy. Hello. I, did I leave somebody out? I feel like I. Okay, do we have everybody? Sorry, okay, yes. So, Sam, oh. I think Cass is trying to join us. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just gonna, okay. I'm just gonna go off and help her. Is sure. <laughs> I was like, I know there's a face I'm missing because I have another name. <laughs> so we'll probably give a few minutes to start and then we'll go from there. Yeah, for the moment, we're going to have the tease the new judge. Exactly. Uh, this was all a part of our elaborate plan. It's a hazing exactly. program, it's fine. <laughs> really, it's YouTube hazing all of us. That's exactly it. Uh, so, um, I don't know if we want to check out the chat and see if anybody has any. Actually, everyone that's watching, put your guesses or your hopes and dreams for some of the nominees in the chat so that we can see what you guys are thinking. We already know, um, we already have the, you know, the winners compiled, but we want to see what the actual people that are watching us right now are hoping and dreaming for. I think I'm officially the only one who knows <laughs> not to look at the results. So, yes, we'll just not react to anything. <laughs> Keep a stoic face the entire time. Yeah, that just let us all. And yeah, we'll all find out at once, and then we can all mutually express our disappointment with our viewers <laughs> at that time. Every year we hope for a live show without any hitches. And I think last year was the only one where that was allowed to happen. So thank you all for joining us in our time of strife. Sam, we appreciate sorry. it. Just technical stuff. The Hangouts link isn't in the doc for Eleanor. It was for all of you though? It's now back to the old link. Just for fun. Someone else, I think, added it just now. I put it back in the Wonderful. Thing. <laughs> I don't know how that happened because I have not opened uh, Google Sheets since I put it in there. I was just saying, I thought Sam was specifically not touching anything yeah, for fear of angering yep. some <laughs> internet <DNA> in. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh. So anybody binge any good Netflix lately? Ooh, I mean, ooh. We hey! Have hey! <laughs> Connor, Wonderful. real MVP. Connor, <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. OK, so Hello. our final judge has joined us. <laughs> All right, so everybody, this is Cass from What Cass Read. So um, Cass, when we're not talking, we're going to be muting our mics. But other than that, we are good to go. <laughs> so thank you all. Hopefully this will be like a wedding and the more unlucky it is, the better it is. So um, first we're gonna go from the short works all the way up the list to our big two categories that are kind of like the best actor and best actress of the Oscars. So we're gonna start with best short work. Um, the nominees for best short work are Binti, The Night Masquerade by Nadia Corfor, Beneath the Sugar Sky by Shada McGuire, and Artificial Condition by Martha Wells. So we will start with Rachel. Do you want me to talk about all of them or just my favorite one? Oh, you're muted. I made the rule and then I broke it. <laughs> um, so probably your favorite one. And then the um, if you have little tidbits about it, well, maybe why you hated one in particular, you did, but otherwise your favorite. I didn't hate any. Um, actually, I thought it was really strong category this year, but it's kind of hard to compare like third and final novellas and series. 
So my favorite one is, of course, Artificial Condition, because I'm a Murderbot fan. It's one of my favorites in the entire series. Um, but I'm not as much of a fan of um, Beneath the Sugar Sky. It was cute, but not as much fun as Artificial Condition. And it has been too long since I read The Night Masquerade to say too much about it, but. Okay, um, Chelsea is next. Um, I am also going for Artificial Condition because I love Murderbot. Uh, I thought it was interesting that out of like the two eligible Murderbot novellas from last year, that this is the one that was nominated. Um, it's actually my second favorite of the Murderbot novellas, <laughs> which is fitting since it's book number two. I actually kind of like the third one a little better. Um, I have a similar feeling to Rachel just in terms of Binti being the last one kind of in the series, and that just makes it hard if you haven't recently read the first two. And I'm just increasingly disappointed with every new Wayward Children book. They uh, get a little worse every time for me, which is sad. So I did not love Beneath the Sugar Sky. All right, next is Claire. Well, uh, I'm also voting for Artificial Condition, so we don't have a problem. Um, so I actually read Night Mask recently, as in for the awards, because I didn't read Home or Night Masquerade when it first came out. So I reread the whole thing. I thought it was really like good writing, mind blowing, whatever. But like, I think in terms of a favorite, the thing that like I'm a fangirl for, it has to be Murderbot. Artificial Conditions also not my favorite of the eligible stuff, but um, yeah, I, I still really, really love it. And I think my problem with it was that it's like a group novella for like it's just got a group on a quest and I much prefer the where were children books when they're like focused on one or two characters I like the second one and the fourth one much better than the third so yeah but artificial condition I mean you know just like the character of Murderbot and like everything about its story and like the way that it like person I think just is really affecting and that punches you in the feels so okay and thomas your vote ah yeah well surprise surprise um artificial condition for me i uh although i, I agree with uh, some of the rest of you i think if you know i had my brothers and if exit strategy had been you know the one i i think you know that would that would probably be of you know all, all the murder bots have been released so far i think is the best but since artificial condition is the one that we you know uh ended up with on the uh, short list it's certainly not a bad choice it's a very good i really enjoy the way like the tone of the whole thing shifted from all systems red to artificial condition where you know the second one is more about murder bot really learning about itself all right and then interacting with art who was delightful i thought and that was a whole lot of fun so I just love what Martha Wells is doing with this series, and to think that not long ago she was like legitimately considering quitting writing altogether because she was so disillusioned with just this and that. You know, she was in that kind of career slump mode, and then this is just sort of, you know, kind of, you know, fi she's like finally getting this recognition and popularity. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. So, um, now, sir, Night Masquerade uh, was terrific, but I. Um, you know, and I'm a big, of course, booster for Nettie Okorafor and uh, the Binti trilogy especially, but I think what might have kind of spoiled it for me, at least in terms of thinking of The Night Masquerade as a novella, is that I went ahead and I read the new edition that is out in hardback from Daw Books, which is Binti the Complete Trilogy, where the whole thing is a bind-up, and then there is also like a new short story which bridges the first two, and so I just, I read that. And when you read that, it does kind of make it feel like it's a, it's a complete experience, like it's a novel. And um, and so now I have kind of have a hard time thinking of The Night Masquerade as an, an isolated work. And so um, it's, it's great, very much uh, worth reading, but I think, yeah, for this category, definitely Murderbot. And as for Beneath the Sugar Sky, yeah, you know, the, the, the Wayward Children's story is wildly inconsistent for me. This one was enjoyable fluff, but that's really all it was, so. Okay, well, we all can do math. So the obvious winner here was Artificial Condition. Um, 
Elizabeth, what was the uh, group choice for this? I think I might suspect. Yeah, I think we could probably all guess this one. The popular vote winner was also artificial condition. <laughs> um, it won with almost double the votes of the next nearest competitor. So a happy lead there. Wow. Okay. Um, what was the next one, just out of curiosity? I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't say, but Beneath the Sugar Sky. Okay. Just double is a lot, so I was just curious. <laughs> Okay, uh, next we have best graphic work, but before we get into that, I'm sort of feeling like this is really sterile with our mics muted, which I know this is my idea, but if you guys are cool with unmuting the mics, that might be cool, because I'm feeling very alone out here because yeah. I can't hear your voices. So, bad idea, Sam, we're not doing that anymore. Okay, everyone can talk now. Um, so it's like, not all at the same time. Yeah, There's like, the idea behind the muted mics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just don't want, like, you know, on my uh, massive air conditioner noise or anything like that. So right. I, don't, I don't mind muting, but, you know. It's yeah. Not if somebody has weird feedback, go ahead and mute. Or like if my dog starts barking, I'll mute to save it. No, if your dog starts barking, bring your dog onto the stream so we can all love on your dog. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't deserve it, she's bad. Okay, um, best graphic work. Well, good next. dogs. <laughs> and the nominees for that are The Adventure Zone, Here There Be Gerblins by the McElroy Brothers and Harry Peach. Thank you. Um, and then Aquacorn Cove by Katie O'Neill and Monsters Volume 3 Haven by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. Uh, so first we will hear from Rachel. This was one of the strangest categories for me because all the nominees are wildly different. I, I almost feel like it's not fair to compare these to each other. My, if, I have, if I have to pick one to vote for, it would be Monstrous Volume 3 because it's just, I love the story, I love the world building, the artwork is beautiful, it's just on the next level. Um, but I also found Aquacorn Cove to just, it was so cute, it was adorable. It was a little bit too simplistic, but it was for children, you know, not for adults. Um, and even though I'm not into gaming or D&D &D and I've never listened to the, the McElroy's podcast, the Adventure Zone graphic novel, it had its fun moments as well. So such such a variety this year. I really enjoyed that, but I'm I'm gonna go with Monstrous. Awesome. Uh, Claire is next. Yeah, I'm also I'm going to echo everything that Rachel said about the strangeness of the category, but I'm also going to it's just as background i haven't actually listened to the adventure zone podcast i do listen to some other mcelroy shows so i kind of felt like the humor like i i kind of felt like yes i can tell that i would like listening to this thing i'm not gonna because it's too long and i don't have time but you know i could tell that i wouldn't really enjoy it if i listened to it and i could tell that if i read the graphic novel having listened to it i would probably absolutely adored it i was just like i wish this is this had existed when i was a student and i had all the time in the world to listen to like really long D, &D shows but like i didn't think it really worked as a standalone thing and i also think that like it took a really long time to get to the point where like there was a twist and you were like oh this is more than quote just a very traditional D, &D campaign and there's like something interesting narratively that's happening aqua thought was lovely in terms of the art um but it felt very didactic to me and that's because it's for children um but i just had a problem kind of getting into the story because of that and monstrous i feel like just gets better um as you get more of the story and i personally felt a lot less confused once i'd read you know one two and three and you know when one was up for all the awards i was like this is pretty on whereas by three i feel like oh i'm very i'm a lot more comfortable in this world and i can understand what's going on and it's cool so connor your vote last i mean it's basically just like repeating everything <laughs> that I said. Um, i'm gonna vote for monsters volume three as well again i i mean i enjoyed them all um and aquacorn cove was really cute and fun um but yeah monstrous is just 
I feel like it's also, I've spent more time with it. So I just love those characters and love that world more. Um, and then I guess with the Adventures on, I actually did go back and listen to the first episode of their podcast version of it. Um, and I totally see why people would love it so much if they've listened to that, because the way that they do it and the way that they like talk to each other during the podcast is really well reflected in the comic book. But I read the comic book first, so I didn't really like it as much. So watch just volume three for me. All right, Monstrous is our judges winner. And it'll be interesting to see uh, next year because I believe Monstrous has won the last three years, I wanna say, for um, graphics. It'll be interesting because I don't know if there's any- But upcoming. it's not eligible no more. Right, it's not. Just just warning all of you now, yeah. okay? We, we stop. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be very interested to see what happens next year unless there's some like very new breakout thing that everyone's loving. Um, so Elizabeth, what won for popular vote? I know you're all going to be completely shocked, but it was monstrous for you three. I like trip. We just have our finger on the pulse of the people, guys. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're actually matching up pretty well this time. I feel yep. like yeah. Way off. Well, let's see it when we get to like yeah. YA. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be yeah, a disaster. That's when the knives come out. Yeah. Oh, that, right. be, yeah, that won't be a discussion at all. <laughs> Next, we have best middle grade. Um, so for this, our nominees are Wondersmith, The Calling of Morgan Crow by Jessica Townsend, Arusha and the End of Time by Rashi Chakshi, and City of Ghosts by Victoria Schwab. And we're gonna hear from Cass first. Yay, okay. This was like hands down the easiest category that I could have ever had. Um, <laughs> it was Wondersmith all the way, Not no contest. I started reading Nevermore last year because of the Book 2 Best FF Awards and then Wondersmith, like I knew I was gonna vote for it as soon as it was announced. I still read the rest of the category cause I'm not a cheater, but <laughs> there was nothing else that could compare. Um, I think story wise, I think just the way that Jessica Townsend writes all these characters and brings you into the world, like nothing else compared to it. And it just didn't feel like it was middle grade. It felt like it was a story for everybody and it just puts it like leaps and bounds above everything else. I mean, I've talked about it nonstop pretty much all this year and all last year. So that was my vote. Awesome. Next we have Elena. Wow, uh, I have to agree. <laughs> uh, Wonder Smith was, yeah, hands down for me as well. And I agree with Cass that I just feel like for me, because I mean, I'm nearing 40 now and I love middle grade, but the middle grades that I love are the ones that um, you know, fit in with everybody and you could, you know, Harry Potter, you, you'd had adults on the train reading them. They made adult cover copies, you know, everyone was reading them and they should be accessible to everyone, including, you know, mid, the middle grade audience, obviously, predominantly, but they should be something that everyone loves. And when I read um, like Nevermore and Wondersmith, I just, I can imagine I, I'm there, you know, I'm on that trolley, uh, on the umbrella trolley going oh down God, the and, rail. yeah I loved it and I just felt this one really came into its own actually I mean I loved Nevermore and gave it five stars but I think this one really just you, you were right in there and I just yeah I really loved it the other two I mean Arrow Shah Arrow just reminds me of Rick Reardon and I'm not a lover of him I just think he's all about the punchline all the time and it gets a bit tiring and City of Ghosts P.E. Schwab just doesn't do it for me I'm really sorry everybody I can't read any of her books any of them um <laughs> So yeah, uh, Wonder Smith for me. All right, uh, next we have Chelsea. Um, okay, uh, V.E. Schwab can take a very loving long walk off a very short literary pier. <laughs> um, I, in keeping with my normal style, I'm going to have to go completely contrary to everything everybody else has said. Uh, I loved Arusha. Um, I think Wonder Smith is amazing. Yes. Um, <laughs> It really knocked my socks off last year when we met Morgan Crow and first kind of got into this world. And it just the second book didn't give me quite that same like magic spark. And I don't know if it's just because we were already in the world and so there was already some familiarity. So all the new shininess didn't quite come across like it did with the first one. Um, I love Rick Riordan and I think that his particular brand of humor works really well for the audience he's writing for. So to have that same kind of pacing and rhythm and style, but translated into a world full of non-white characters and into a storyline that's not as familiar to like a Western reading audience. 
Um, I just think it's amazing. I love Roshni Choksi. I love what she's doing at every level that she's like writing in. Um, so yeah, I, it's not that I don't love Jessica Townen, Townsend and didn't love Wondersmith, but I just really have to come out batting for Ari Shaw this year. I am excited that there's like already some like agreement. <laughs> like I'm like, yes. okay. Um, so next we have Connor. So I'm gonna also go with Wondersmith. Um, I mean, it's just, as what everyone said, it's just leaps and bounds better. It's like anyone could read it and really enjoy it. Um, I think that this one actually, like, honestly, people compared the first one to Harry Potter, and I feel like it still is like following that same beat pattern, like the same things, sort of things that happen in the Chamber of Secrets where like he's like ostracized and everything, like that happens to Morgan in this. So I feel like it's still following that same kind of vibe. Um, which I'm really enjoying. I also really enjoyed Arusha. I love that she was a little liar. Um, and I really enjoyed, what was her name, Minnie? I think her mm -hmm. name is Minnie. She's awesome. Um, and then City of Ghosts. I mean, it was good. Like, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like, it wasn't near the other two for me. And I also really enjoy Rick Riordan's humor. So I enjoyed that one, but Wondersmith takes the cake. All right, and last we have Rachel. No surprise. I loved Wonder Smith. I agree with what everybody's already said about it. Um, I, I loved Nevermore, and I thought that Wonder Smith was like taking it to the next level. I just I adored it so much. Um, I did I didn't love the premise and the the mythology woven into Arusha. It just it was different, and I really liked that. But I'm one of those people. I I've never read anything by Rick Riordan. I've never tried any of his stuff, so I don't I don't know how to compare it to that but the humor in it really grates on my nerves. It was, it was too much. <laughs> Don't try any Rick Riordan. Yeah. You would probably cross that one off your list. So it's like, I, I plan on continuing reading that series as I, I think it's worth reading, but uh, it just, yeah. Um, and City of Ghosts is probably my second favorite thing I've ever read by, by Victoria Schwab. And I, that's not saying too much because I still don't like her books that much, but it was readable, let's say. <laughs> sure, it's readable. Uh, it was words on page. Right. That, sense order. that was damning with faint praise. <laughs> <laughs> this book was full of words that I could pick out yeah. on the page. So obviously our winner is uh, Wondersmith and Elizabeth, what did the public say? Another time where we are Totally in agreement. Uh, the public Yay. vote was also for Wonder Smith again by double in a single round. So it was clearly the winner. Our hive mind programming is working. <laughs> Yay! <Finally. laughs> it's taken so long. All right, next category is Best YA. Uh, for this, we have Muse of Nightmares by Lainey Taylor, Skyward by Brandon Sanderson, and The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. Um, Elena. This one was quite close, well, not really close, but it, the two top were quite close for me. Uh, I went for Muse of Nightmares. Um, I just, oh, Lenny Taylor, I just love her writing. It feels like you're reading someone's dream. It's like she's woken up and I just, she just brings so much emotion. I just can't, that she has such a large amount in such, you know, such a small space. She could fill up books and books and books and she manages to make it all real. I loved, I'm not going to spoil anything because it's the second, but I loved the towards the end how it changed and how she managed to sort of manipulate the two storylines in with each other. I just thought it was really brilliant. I mean, Skyward was a close second for me. Um, I seem to like Brandon Sanderson's sort of more YA books. I like his fast paced writing, so that and like Steelheart and those books worked quite well for me. I did enjoy that, but. Yeah, Muse of Nightmare was up there, and Cool Prince I didn't really have much time for. I know a lot of people love it, but I just thought the main character was a whiny brat, so. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so Muse of Nightmare. <laughs> awesome. All right, um, I will go next. This is the first category that I judged. Um, so I'm also gonna go with Muse of Nightmares, which shocked me because I did not love Strange the Dreamer as much as a lot of people did um, last year. Um, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I just I just didn't quite get the appeal. What I liked about this one, I think, was that it wasn't such a focus on their like love story. Like it was still very much that was a part of it, but I feel like they were focusing and worrying about a lot more going on. So I went in uh, kind of expecting to not like it and end up really enjoying it. Um, 
I did not love Skyward. Um, I, I, it's fine, uh, um, which surprised me because I love like almost all of their Sanderson. So I was a little bit shocked by that. But I, I found the main character in that one kind of insufferable, um, and didn't love how it felt like to me she didn't grow a ton throughout the book, and then she grew a lot at the end. Um, so I didn't love the pacing of like her arc, even though I probably would continue because space. Um, and then Cruel Prince, I felt kind of the same as far as um, it would being very, very hyped and me just not quite getting it. Although I'm intrigued by the second book, which will probably show up on next year's list. So I'll read it then. So my vote was Muse of Nightmares. Um, and Cass. Okay, so this category for me, like I rated all of them the same on Goodreads. So I was like, I don't even know what I'm gonna go for. Um, but I will go for Muse of Nightmares as well. Um, and I'll go backwards. So like The Cruel Prince, I couldn't tell you a single reason why I love this book. I'm just like complete trash for it. It just, it just did all the things for me, but it's not particularly very good. The characters aren't very good. The, the love interest wasn't very good yet. I just like <laughs> couldn't stop reading it. And then I like plowed through whatever the second one was, The Wicked King. Yeah, I read that. Um, yeah, I just want to hardest co sign everything you're saying, Cass. I don't know why, but it's such a trash fire for this horrible book. I just yeah, want to co sign. So that one was a five. Um, Skyward, I had a ton of fun. This is actually the first book I've read of Sanderson that isn't Mistborn. And I'm currently reading Warbreaker right now. So I'm like slow on the Sanderson uptake because I've been uh, in the world of Robin Hobb for so long. So I'm slow into Sanderson, but he was also a five. But I just felt like Muse of Nightmares, if there was ever a book that had like a really lasting impact on what I thought about it long after I finished it, it was definitely Muse of Nightmares, definitely the ending, uh, just the duology was top notch. So my vote goes to Muse of Nightmares. All right, so obviously Muse of Nightmares is our vote all around. Did the public agree with us yet again? Uh, no. no. Oh, it's the <laughs> cool. yeah. Is it the Cruel Prince? It's the Cruel Prince, isn't it? It is not the Cruel Prince. It's Skyward. Whoa. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, don't be all nodding like all oh, y'all knew it was going to be the Sanderson. Like you just were calling it. Yeah, oh, that was shocking to me. It was the Sanderson by a while as well. Like, wow. Yeah. Everybody just stands Brandon Sanderson on book two. I'm hypothesizing though that this is a lot of, I'm wondering if some of the adult, primarily adult readers that we have that follow this award mm -hmm. um, were reading the Sanderson because they already liked Sanderson and weren't necessarily yeah. reading the other books. And so it got skewed because I just yeah. don't find, I don't believe, yeah. I don't believe it. Well, Holly Black has some, but mostly uh, Brand Sanderson has more you know, a, a, a adult works out there. Dude, to be on Tumblr, you would think that Holly Black had turned into the sun and consumed the world <laughs> right. with the cool prints. Right. You would think that nothing else had been published in the last decade that wasn't yeah. the cool prints yeah. just coming from Tumblr. So yeah. that kind of surprises me. So if the YA community was speaking, I feel like it would have gone to the cool oh, prints. So the fact that it was... Yeah, I think we've annoyed them in the past, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> They're no longer yeah. here anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. was the vote? Not close. Oh. Oh, like double again, right? <laughs> it's again, just, like surprising. Like I don't. It didn't win as swiftly as some of the other categories, but it was substantially higher. Hmm. All right. If well, anyone doesn't realize why I'm saying about rounds and how quickly stuff won, it's because we use uh, alternative vote or instant runoff rather than just popular sort of first past the post and stuff that the rest of us don't get into. There's always a wizard who runs the thing who does the numbers. We're just like, sure. <laughs> we through the books. He'd be lying to us and we'd have no idea. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. we know Elizabeth just makes the shortlist every year. I'm just kidding. I don't actually think that happens. No, we actually we but. see the results. We just don't follow them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the next category is best debut. Um, this, the nominees for this are Children of Blood and Bone by Tomei Adeyemi, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang, and Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. First we'll hear from Rachel. I'm usually a big, big science fiction fan, but I have to say that the debut category is one of my favorite categories for these awards because you can get such an interesting mix with it being people's first books. Um, that being said, it was really easy for me to pick a winner this year. I 
hated parts of Children of Blood and Bone. I found it to be incredibly cliche, disappointingly so. Um, the Poppy War was also kind of cliche. I don't hear many people talking about kind of the tropes it's using, but it was quite easy to predict what was going to happen. And uh, it was a bit too violent and grim for me. I think I think it is grim dark fantasy. Um, so Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse is, it's my pick this year, is my favorite. I was incredibly impressed by it. It's urban fantasy with Navajo um, culture and mythology woven into it. And I thought that was so unusual, really different and pulled off really well, so. Uh, next we have Cass. Okay, so <laughs> this category, I just wasn't impressed with pretty much any of them. So I'm voting for The Poppy War by default because it was the only book out of all three of these that I actually like felt some enjoyment while reading it. I did not finish Children of Blood and Bone. And we cleared it as judges in our little group chat beforehand that you can still vote in a category even if you've DNF'd it. And I DNF'd Children of Blood and Bone. It was, it was tired for me. And then I actually really hated Trail of Lightning. Um, I feel like it's, it's, <laughs> it's not a popular opinion. Um, but I just also felt like I've seen this before. I've seen this like really gritty girl who like loves guns and grew up really tough, but nothing that she did was like for herself. It was following this main love interest around for the entirety of the book. And I was like, oh my God, I'm just over him. So that one was a really big struggle for me to get through. Um, the Poppy War, yeah, there was like lots of cliches, but Spoiler alert, I'm Asian, so there were some cliches that I just really liked. And I think that's why it was like a default vote for me. So it's not an enthusiastic vote, just a default poppy war. All right, next is Elena. Yeah, I have to agree. It was a pretty sort of tepid, mediocre category in general. I didn't like Children of Blood and Bone really at all, full of tropes and cliches and yeah, I didn't like that one really that much at all. The other two, I was pretty sort of on the fence about which one I like the best. Um, but I think I'm going to vote for Poppy War, mainly because I just like that it is based on a real life event. Uh, they've, they've managed to incorporate something real into the fantasy. Um, and that part of it is really graphic. And I think that's quite important to like remember. And it certainly made me start thinking about uh, it a bit more. I liked that there was no major romance in there. For once we've got like a book that isn't focused heavily on the sort of romantic element and more about um, like the story arc of the main character who I felt was not great at the beginning and started to sort of come into her own a bit more and make those hard choices as we went on. Trail of Lightning I liked um, but I think Urban Fantasy is just not my thing. I don't think it works for me so much. And I felt like the ending, we sort of really slow and then all of a sudden, bang, 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 everything at the end. And um, it was, yeah. And I've read the synopsis for the next one and I think it's all going to be based on her, like, recovering the lost love or whatever. So not to spoil anything. Yeah, so I'm going to vote for Poppy Wall. And then we have Chelsea. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and split the judges and say <laughs> that I loved Trail of Lightning. Um, I liked The Poppy War and Children of Blood and Bone probably both about equally. This whole category is a little dark <laughs> this year. Like the books in of themselves are uh, a little on the darker side. So I think that Trail of Lightning was well, a book that managed to be both dark and hopeful. And I've never seen an urban fantasy book that does what Rebecca Roanhorse is able to do, both in terms of like the the way she's able to give us characters and touchstones and emotional beats that feel familiar while also building not only this entirely new like post-apocalyptic world, but also this post-apocalyptic world that's based on a chunk of like myth and legend and folklore that I will speak for me, I am mostly unfamiliar with and largely unfamiliar with, with the exception of probably a few, like, few key touchstones. Um, so just to see what she managed to do in such a compact amount of space while still giving people a satisfying urban fantasy read in a world that's so vastly new and creative, I just really loved it. Also, it wasn't like a million pages long. So 
I am fucking here for that. <laughs> There's too many wrong books this year. Um, but yeah, so my vote goes to Trail of Lightning. Okay, Thomas, you are our tiebreaker. Do uh, it right, Thomas. <laughs> Okay, well then you will be happy to know that uh, I am uh, I'm very much on a trail of lightning person. Yeah, yeah. he's so um, anti-popular. Yeah. Well, one thing that I liked about this year's uh, debut uh, finalists was that we had this fantastically diverse array of fantasy. You had Native American fantasy, Asian themed fantasy, and um, and then for uh, God, what's the hell? This the other book. Where's my African? brain? Yes, oh, well, Nigerian. Yeah. 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 Children of Blood and Bone. You see how memorable that book is to me. I actually thought, okay, when I read Children of Blood and Bone, I thought, all right, well, this is like decent for its target audience, right? And it's you know West African heroine, and that's really awesome for that readership. And uh, you know, lots of good action in the first half, and then we get like into the second half of the book, and the cliches, mm -hmm. and like the worst, not just the cliches, but like the worst cliches she could have picked. And she's just throwing them in the book, and I was, and it was just so disappointing after it got off to such a, a promising start. So, hmm. yeah, I'll read the second one to see what she does, but I'm not expecting the second one to necessarily play to her strengths in any way. Um, the Poppy War is a book that I, while I was impressed with the ambition of it, um, uh, the execution just uh, frustrated me. Yes, it is cliche right out of the bat this time you know the in fact and it's and it's so it's so cliche for so long right like you have the school sequence right which is i'm you know that whole trope of i'm the person you know i'm the kid from you know the the, the poor kid i'm gonna go to the magic school where i'm gonna be the best at everything and it's and it's 200 pages of the book you know and to a to, to a foregone conclusion well it's like yeah well obviously we know she's gonna end up like top because there's a whole like second half of a book to get through uh, so I thought that entire sequence could have been shorn by like, like down to maybe 70 or 80 pages and still gotten its business done and then gotten us into like the meat of the story, which is like, you know, the invasion and defending the land and all of that. Um, and then there was the little problem of Rin, who I, I found to be just incredibly frustrating. I, I, I elicited very little sympathy from, from me as a protagonist, so I just couldn't feel anything for her. But it, again, I'm impressed at the way that Rebecca Quang was like using the story at times to, you know, shine a light on, you know, real life atrocities and things like that. So it's a, it's a really mixed bag, but not enough for me to have have made a good book. So yeah, so that leaves us with Trail of Lightning, which is, um, you know, a wonderful, just, just yes, it's in a lot of ways boilerplate urban fantasy, but by setting it in this post-apocalyptic. Uh, you know, world uh, and basing everything upon Native American folklore and legends and the culture there. And I, I just, I felt like Chelsea said, I was experiencing a new world. You know, it was like, you know, everything was there, but it was like just being, you know, it was maybe may been old wine in new bottles, but it was, you know, still good wine. And it was, uh, it's so just very, very exciting for me. And I didn't even really mind the romantic aspect of it, simply because it what didn't feel as cliche as most, you know, uh, urban fantasy and paranormal romances just, you know, tick off all the boxes in terms of like paperback romance cliches. And Rebecca Roanhorse didn't really handle her characters in that way. You know, at least the way that the, the romance played out in the story. I mean, I was able to like, you know, okay, that's fine. They're, I mean, and actually I like them, so I don't mind this. So I felt like it was a real, you know, like journey into another time and place uh, and, and, and felt very new in spite of just doing, you know, in, in the same way, I, I would compare it to um, Certain Dark Things, a book by Silvio Moreno Garcia, mm -hmm. which is a vampire novel that I, I mean, it, it, one genre that I have no patience for at all is vampire fiction. And I read this book and it was fantastic because it's in this sort of, you know, a gritty near future Mexico City. And again, just by kind of, you know, switching everything around and changing things up, the cultural perspective just made it a completely new experience. And it's like, wow, I just felt like this reinvented this genre. And that kind of feels like what Trail of Lightning did with urban fantasy for me. So go Rebecca. Yay. I had stakes in this, even though I didn't read Poppy War, but I wanted Trail of Lightning to win. So yay. Um, so Trail of Lightning won. <laughs> Great. Um, and what did, what did the public say? So the popular vote winner was actually Poppy War. Um, oh, yeah. oh, so nice. we've split choices again. <laughs> but um, how close was it? How close was it? It was much closer <laughs> than the re the categories that we've already done this one, but it still romped home quite well. Um, 
but uh, yeah, much closer. But then, mm. yeah, it was a book a lot of people have read and enjoyed, but I think it does split the audience. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> okay, are you ready, friends? Now we're get we're gonna get into it. Let's get into it. This these are our final two categories, and where most of us are voting. Um, so we're gonna go with the science fiction, the adult science fiction first. Um, our nominees are uh, The Calculating Stars by Mary Rebinette Kowal, Record of a Spaceborn Few by Becky Chambers, and Vengeful by V.E. Schwab. Chelsea. Oh, <laughs> starting with me? Oh, I totally wasn't prepared for that. I haven't done first yet. Um, well, safe to say Vengeful didn't make the cut. And... <laughs> I really enjoyed the calculating stars, but I feel like because it's part of a duology, it's hard to get a really satisfying read from it without the second um, part being involved. Not to say that the story itself doesn't stand alone, but in terms of just like emotional resolution and wrapping up the story, it feels a little bit unbalanced for me missing the second part. Um, and I just will always, come to bat for everything that Becky Chambers is doing in terms of her like found family ragtag space Muppets, like having adventures and loving each other and being supportive in the midst of like all the various turmoils and shenanigans. Um, she's knocked it out of the park for me from day one. I really, really love Record of a Spaceborn View. Uh, so I'm gonna have to go with that and give it to Becky Chambers. Next we have Connor. All right, sorry, I was muted. Um, I'm actually gonna vote for The Calculating Stars. I just finished this one this morning. <laughs> um, I really, really enjoyed it, which is so interesting because usually I like really fast paced books and this one isn't really, it's really just following her as she's like, you know, fighting against men being awful. Like the men in this book make me so annoyed except for her husband. Mm -hmm. I mean, even at some parts her husband was annoying me. Um, but I tried the Becky Chambers series. I read the first two books and I was in the middle of the third one. I just wasn't really enjoying the series all that much. Um, and then, yeah, Vengeful, it's just like, whatever. Can we just take a pass on Vengeful? Can we all just be like, no. <laughs> all right, we have Rachel next. This may be harsh, but I think Vengeful wins for most unnecessary sequel ever. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm not a category, but yeah, sure does. I, the whole, I, I listened to this one on audiobook, and the whole time I was listening to it, I just thought, I didn't need to know any of this. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Which is sad, because I, I actually liked Vicious. It's the, the, the other of the two books by Schwab that I've actually enjoyed. So that was a real letdown. Um, Record of a Spaceborn Few, I'm a big Becky Chambers fan, and I totally agree with what Chelsea said. I, I love the themes of this, I love the found family, I, I love what this book was saying, but there was something about the structure of it with the chapters being too short and switching between people so frequently. I could never get into the flow of the story, it felt incredibly disjointed. So, like, I intellectually like it for what it's saying, but I didn't enjoy reading it as much as I wanted to. And it's no no surprise, I'm totally here for the calculating stars. <laughs> I adore that book. I love everything about it. Um, to the point I'm a bit, I don't I don't know what to say about it. So <laughs> Okay, um, next is me. Um, so Record of a Space Born Few gets it for me because they are my, yeah. yes, I'm right with Chelsea. Yes, I, I love them so much. Um, I just love what she does with like slice of life in space um, and everyone just being like pure um, and it, and the problems not being like the world is ending. It's just like, you know, problems of daily life, but in space and the way that it feels like, like the world building that she does with it and, and cultures and everything else is, is so good. Um, so I love that. I did really like, um, the Calculating Stars, I listened to that on audio and the author narrates that and she's also, I think, award-winning for audiobook narration as well. So she's great. Um, so I really enjoyed that and just the the historical um, elements that she pulled in with the science fiction. I did start to get sick of the amount of space sex puns 
that the dream couple <laughs> was doing all the time. I'm like, I get it. His rocket. I get it. Okay. Like, do you know whatever. how many dick jokes there have to be for me to be tired of your dick jokes? My it's God. a lot. It's a very high bar, and it's a Every lot. Every time, like the first time they did it, I'm like, that's cute. And then, and then after, like the third, I'm like, okay, stop with the, <laughs> with the initiating sequences and everything else. Um, <laughs> so, and vengeful. I'm just gonna repeat what everyone else said that it's an unnecessary sequel. I'm, I'm. I'm starting to get mad at Victoria Schwab. Like before I just didn't like her and now I'm like actually angry at you because Vicious was so good. I only read Vicious last year and loved it. Um, but she just needs to know when to stop and she doesn't. So no for Vengeful. Um, but yeah, Record of a Spaceborn Few. So now we're in a, co a competition. There's a war going on and Thomas is next. Oh, do I get to break the tie? No, there's more people after you. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right, I love like when the fate of the world was in my hands. I have the <laughs> steep kind of thing. It's like, all right, well, uh, first thing, all, I, all I'm gonna say about Vengeful is that if you are someone who legitimately thought that Vengeful deserved to be on any award shortlist in the category of best science fiction novel of the year, all that tells me is you don't read science fiction, you just read Vicki Schwab. We love all of our viewers equally and are so glad that you are all here for participating with us in this award show. Thank <laughs> all of you for your nominations. Get out there and find some more stuff, folks. But um, okay, uh, yeah, Record of Space More Few. Uh, I, I guess it's no secret that I don't really get on with Becky Chambers. I, I didn't like hate this one enough to stick pencils in my eyes like I did with Small Angry Planet. But uh, yeah, I just, I, if I could believe it more with her whole, with her whole found family shtick, I would, I, I would be more into it, but I'd have just never really, um, you know, found her characters and her people and the situations just always seem to be, you know, it's like Forrest Gump. Everything's like super, super contrived to like jab emotional hot buttons. And I just feel like it's a bit too artificial in that regard. So, you know, for my taste. Um, Calculating Stars is, is was just wonderful. I mean, it was as an alternate history that, you know, not only just shone a light on this hidden history about the Mercury launches where, you know, like, there really were a bunch of women who were training to be astronauts, uh, you know, the original Mercury launches, and then and, and dealing not only just with, uh, you know, the, the sexism that um, she has to deal with, but then she's having to examine her own prejudices uh, that she's really been unaware of and, and, and having to, like, you know, take a look at herself. And then there's... Yeah, the the husband and wife relationship, which is of course, you know, yeah, the, the sex <laughs> metaphors and puns got a bit silly, but wow, wow, what a wonderful depiction still of a strong marriage and a supportive husband who is just sort of like, Yeah, I mean, I'm just I got your back the whole way. And I thought that was that was just kind of nice to see. And and I thought it was just exciting, you know, it, science fiction, you know, it's about to, you know, a, a disaster happens, scientists get together and science the shit out of it to solve the problem. <laughs> And in the midst, it's got all of the social commentary and all of the, you know, examining of, you know, America's history through this old history lens. So I just thought it was a beautifully put together story. And you don't really, I mean, it does stand alone. I mean, you could, it's a part of a duology, but each of the books kind of very much is its own, own thing. So you don't really, you know, require the second one to be able to like this one, I think, on its own. So, and I think it's very cinematic. You know, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, Mary Robinette's agent hasn't, uh, you know, placed this, you know, somewhere yet, because I think it's just a matter of time. It's, it's, it's it, a natural, I think, for a good adaptation. I want, I want it to be Patty Jenkins' next movie. You know, in a perfect world that way. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, uh, so that's me, Barry Robinette for me. Okay, before we proceed, I just want to point out that Chelsea and Mai's lips made the same motion when you were speaking about Record of a Space Born For You, and I just felt that I had a kindred spirit there. So I just wanted to reflect. I'm, um, so I feel like. I'm very pleased to have given you that moment to share with one of them. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens and if you're wrong, Thomas. Um, so Claire is next. <laughs> Thomas is wrong. I Okay, so first of all, I DNF vicious halfway through and then I read some of Vengeful to not be a cheater, but mm, why? Um, I don't want to be telling people like what counts as science fiction and what doesn't count as science fiction, but I was surprised that what felt like a discrepancy in quality between like the things that were not great but you know that's just me i think both calculating stars and spaceborne few a record of a spaceborne few do a lot of like 
kind of really radical work. Um, I just think that record of a spaceborne few comes in a package where like it talks to you about what humanity does after it's majorly, majorly, majorly messed up, and you know how we rebuild and how we build a world that functions on a completely different like axis of basically to me morality because of what it does in terms of like you know like how the accident fleet works um and of course the calculating stars like does a lot of great work in like showcasing some plenty of real history and real science and it like tackles a lot of really um important i have anxiety so you know it also talks to me that way but to me when i was reading calculating stars i had to take breaks because it was too much suffering all the time it was like mm. women are suffering people of color are suffering jewish people are suffering like you know uh, people with anxiety are suffering you know all of this like it was just it kept heaping you know on top of each other whereas when i was reading record of a space bone few i was like oh humanity in space getting better <laughs> so um record of a space born few for me Oh my gosh. So Cass, you have the power. Whoa. Here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so just, just remember to follow. No pressure. Back, you know, <laughs> first time to get strong. All right. Amazing. Okay. All right. So I will say that the sci fi category, I was like happy about it, but also just like eh about it initially because that's not my wheelhouse. Um, and then when all the votes started rolling in, I was like, okay, I can see myself getting into some of these books. But then I will say like Vengeful, we can do better. Book two, Best of Best Community, we can do better. Um, I was like reading Goodreads and I was reading all these things on Twitter of people like really upset that Vengeful got in. And so I'm just gonna put it out there, if you don't like that, then nominate. Nominate your favorite science fiction yes. books next year because we have to read them all and we want to know what some good science fiction is um but anyway so vengeful was out for me out so it came down to the calculating stars and record of a spaceborne few um i ranked them both equally on goodreads i both i gave them both five stars they were incredible like the calculating stars i told everybody about this book um and i also said that it made me wish I had tried harder in calculus in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I would have gone on a different path, but no, I was an English major. Um, but it just like made me feel so good about like, man, I really could have gone into STEM or high school girls who are reading this or college girls who are reading this thinking, oh, maybe there's some like cool things I could actually do with my math degree or my physics degree. Um, so like pro calculating stars that way. But Record of a Spaceborn Few is my vote. Yes, um, accurate. <laughs> Good choice, Cass. Well done. Yes. Yes. It just made me feel like it. It had me in my feelings for a long time. Um, I listened to both of them on audiobook, and for Record of a Spaceborn Few, like I kind of tag teamed reading it and listening to it on audio, and kind of helped me through some of those pacing issues. I think some of the other judges mentioned, um, but the message for each of the books was incredible. I read all three of them like during this award season too, cause I had not read the other two. And just like the thoughts that you have about death and what you do as a community around life. It, it just got me in my feelings that the way that the calculating stars didn't, even though that was still a five-star book. So record of a space born few. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So all right. did the popular vote match up with us? Or not. Are they right, Elizabeth? Did they get it right this time? They did. <laughs> hey. Yay! It was record of a spaceborne few. Um, it was close initially, but it took off after the, the rounds went along. So yes, it won comfortably, and very pleased we all are. Wonderful. Um, although calculating stars is still really good. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was yeah. I was thinking it was going to be calculating stars. So. Yeah, I, I would did too. I was yeah. honestly also to be completely fair. Yeah. I'm a little surprised. Good job, guys. <laughs> Stars interesting writing and has won a nebula and is going to win a Hugo. So, yeah. you know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mary Robert Cole is not hurting because she didn't just win the Book Two <laughs> FFF Award in Best Adult Fantasy category. Like, she'll be all right. 
All right, so now we have our final category, uh, Best Adult Fantasy. The nominees for this are Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett, Grey Sister by Mark Lawrence, and Circe by Madeline Miller. And can I just say, I am very nervous for this because I've rated all of these books five stars. So as the host, I've put myself last so that you guys discussing them can make me actually pick one because <laughs> they're all my sweet, sweet children and I love them a lot. So- uh, It's manipulative and Machiavellian and I like it, Sam. <laughs> I like what you've done. I like the way you're doing it. So first we're gonna go with Connor. <clears throat> all right. Um, so I feel bad for Foundryside because I read it at like a bad time. I had just moved. So it like lost my attention. So I wasn't paying attention to it. So I feel bad for that one. I'm going to try to reread that one later. Um, just because like, I feel like I would really enjoy it under different circumstances, but you know, life and everything. Um, I really enjoyed Circe. I thought that like, I really liked the fact that she's like a quieter character, but she's still super strong. Um, and I just really think that Madeline Miller did a good job of like portraying the attitude that like an immortal being would have, um, especially like one that's ostracized from other immortal beings. Um, but I ended up voting for Grey Sister just because I am so invested in this world and all the characters. Like I just love Nona so much, and I want her and Ara, Ara, Ara Arabella to be like together and happy. But like it's so grim that I don't know if they will. But um, yeah, definitely Grey Sister. I freaking love that world and love the magic and love all the characters and yeah. All right, Chelsea. All right, um, let's see. I also did not love Foundry Side. It was just, in complete fairness to the book, I think it just hit at a time when I was very bogged down with lots of other long books that we were reading for this award. And so it got split attention and I didn't, love it. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it nearly as much as I liked the other two. Um, my thing with Cersei is I love reclaiming female narratives, especially from like, quote, lost or like, under storified, like historical characters or characters from mythology and stuff. So I really love what Madeline Miller is doing with her whole like, oeuvre of storytelling with like retelling the, the myths and that kind of stuff. But like, Song of Achilles was one of my top five favorite books of literally all time ever. And this just wasn't that. And so while that's not necessarily entirely fair, I just have to go with Grey Sister. Fucking murderous lesbian nun assassins is everything that my 2019 soul is like thriving on. It's, I want to like overthrow the world in political revolution and institute a red sister policy. Not really, it'd be very violent. I'm just saying, I just, like, everything about these books, the world building, the characters, the relationships, like, it's just all working for me in a way that kind of took me off guard um, with how much I loved First Red Sister and now Grey Sister, like, on top of that. Like, this whole universe kind of uh, caught me a little bit beneath the feet with how intensely I actually love it. So, yeah, I have a feeling the third book will probably also be nominated, and I'm going to really like it. So, yeah, my vote in this category is for Grey Sister. We have Rachel next. I don't really have a horse in this race. Um, and unfortunately, this year I didn't feel much of anything for any of the three nominees. Um, I had the same problem with Grey Sister as I had with Red Sister last year. Yes. Um, I can't. I I did not manage to read it because um, there's something too brutally violent about the world. It's I find it very deeply un unsettling and upsetting. Can't really explain why. So. I want to love that series because I, I love the world building and I think it's a fascinating world, but um, I couldn't vote for that one because I've never managed to get through one of the books. Um, Foundry Side was way too forgettable. Like I enjoyed it while I was reading it. It was, it was good times, but it did not stick with me. And Circe, I've never read anything else by Madeline Miller. I've never read Song of Achilles. So I was coming into this one with some high expectations, expecting it to really blow my socks off. And I thought it was surprisingly tepid. <laughs> Don't hate me for saying that people who love Cersei. Um, but I think I think I approached it more as as expecting like an original story, as as reinventing the tale. And it turned out that I already knew much of, of the story because I guess I was familiar with the character and I didn't feel like it was adding that much. And yet it's the one I'm going to vote for because out of all of these, it's the one that 
aesthetically has stuck with me the most, the, the sensations, the feelings of it, and the setting and the character, I still think about that, so. You theater. should definitely go read Song of Achilles. It's super great. It's really great. <laughs> great it was the influence you. It's so great. It's really good. Spoiler <laughs> alert: Achilles dies, but after that, <laughs> you're golden. <laughs> so next, we have Thomas. Let me unmute my unmute button. There we are. All right. Uh, this was probably. Uh, this this was a, a pretty strong category. I thought that the, all the all the selections, you know, had a, a lot of merit uh, out of all the categories this year. Um, so it was a good a good bunch of finalists. I am actually much to my su considerable surprise, uh, going to go with Gray Sister on this one, which I thought was uh, uh, even an improvement on Red Sister. You know, it's just an, an, an incredibly immersive, dark world um with just some amazing conflicts and uh just fantastic characters uh foundry side it was like really really close because i had a ton of fun with foundry side foundry side for me was a fun book and um i enjoyed you know the characters i the the protagonist especially and then like her little relationship with the, the, the little key um if anything sort of like pulled it back a bit, it's, I think like the climax got a bit too much, like, you know, felt like a Marvel movie at the end, you know, it's like just the, the way the action was being played out. Uh, but I like the whole concept of the magic system and all of that. It felt, it felt very fresh and it was just a, a fun, witty read, you know, and uh, Robert Jackson Bennett has a sense of humor that I respond well to. And uh, as for Kirka, which is the way to say it, if you're Greek, Kirka. Um, no, we're not. Yeah. None of us here are. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess it's because I've been playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey and everyone is like saying the names the way the Greek people would say them. So it's, oh, Aphrodite. Okay, yeah. That's, uh, yeah so, Peak yeah. historical accuracy, yeah. that Assassin's Creed. Uh, Kirka, okay. I kind of like how that sounds, actually. Kirka. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I mean, I liked that, but it, 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 and I and I enjoyed, you know, the, the treatment of the character and sort of like the retelling of this myth. But um, I kind of felt like Rachel did that it was just sort of a bit lukewarm all the way through, you know. Um, so good, but not, you know, and definitely worth reading. I'd recommend it, but not like, you know, the one I would heap, you know, awards on. I feel so great, sister. I I was I liked being surprised at myself for picking that one. So I'm. Uh, yeah, and if you're a fan of that series, then you know everybody who loves you know the the books of the ancestor series. I got to tell you, this is, needs to be your next read. <laughs> got to get into the Armored Saints by Mike Cole. If you if you like Nona, you'll love Heloise. I think so. So that's it. Next we have Claire. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um. I wasn't sure how I was going to vote in this one for a while, actually. I thought all, well, I'm going to vote for Grey Sister, but until we started talking about it now, I was kind of like, oh, they were all fine, whatever. But then, like, as soon as we start talking about the characters and what happens, I'm like, oh, yes, no, I'll read the third book. And I'm not sure that I would pick up the next Boundary side book, for instance, um, which yeah, mainly my my thing about Cersei is you know, I enjoyed it. The writing was the prose was beautiful. I thought, but I thought it was actually like remarkably slow going for something that's you know I don't know. It covers so many actual human years, like the lifespans of many mortals, and yet it was remarkably slow. When I was reading Grey Sister, I kind of felt like, like in the middle of Grey Sister, I had a bit of a slump where I was like, oh really, it feels like we're retreading a lot of beats from the first book. It feels like everything that's happening all the time is just Nona getting like punched in the face all the time <laughs> by various people. And then I felt like that really took um, a turn for the better by doing new things that the first book hadn't necessarily done by like kind of changing up the setting a little bit without going into spoilers and like the ending of that book I really enjoyed and yeah now that we can kind of see where the little prologue and, and epilogue bits are going I just want to see that confrontation that's happening. Foundry side I thought was fun I thought Clef was roll annoying and I also at the end 
when the baddies are revealed, there are some like really tired tropes about like the baddies and like who they are. Um, and um, spoilers, they're just evil women because <laughs> women are evil. So, or the protagonists, either or. All right, then we have Cass. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go through them again one by one. Um, well, I'm gonna vote for Grey Sister. If you couldn't tell by my little shoulder dance, it is top, top, top. It just leveled up from Red Sister in so many ways. Um, and I didn't think I could have more fun with the convent and the girls and the nuns and they're all, all their different relationships. And Abbas um, Glass just maneuvering her little everybody around, it just spoke to me. I have to like bring my, my head back because I finished Grey Sister at the end of last year and then I literally just finished Holy Sister. But from how we end Grey Sister, it's just like such a great cliffhanger, such a great um, culmination of what Nona has gone through in this time period. Loved it. Um, so that's, that's my vote. But Foundry side, I'll agree with everybody else that of all the books in this category, this one did feel the most forgettable. I listened to this one on audio and I had fun while I was reading it, but I don't think I could tell you anything about Foundry side anymore. Like it's been that forgettable for me. Um, Cersei, I think that prose, beautiful. I agree with that. It just felt like a mythology name drop most of the time to the point where I was just like, okay, sis, we need to get the ball rolling. And it never does. Um, I did write in my Goodreads review on this that I'm not like so mad about how long and lingering the timeline took for this because it felt timeless because why would a goddess need to have time as like a construct for herself? She's going to go on forever. And so that really felt <laughs> apparent when I was reading it that time didn't need to move very quickly for her because her life was forever. So that I do give it props for and the pros and weaving a tale that I had heard before, but just, I needed it to get a move on. So my vote's for Grey Sister. Okay, I'm so glad that I saved myself for last so that I can defend all of my children because some of you are real mean to them. Um, so we're gonna talk about Cersei first. Um, I loved the audiobook version. I don't know what you guys all read, um, Cersei. Audio. audio. Okay, the audio, audio is like mm -hmm. top yeah. notch. Um, so the fact of like, basically a goddess reading you her story just was beautiful and wonderful to me. And I also yeah. liked that the, her story is basically like all these famous men aren't shit um, kind of thing, which was like real great. Um, and I just liked her just, she had this like sad feeling to her for a lot of the, her time and like that tragedy feeling. I just, I like <laughs> angst. So it really like spoke to me in that way. Um, and I just, you know, I just really loved it. I'm, I'm shocked. You know, I'm <laughs> jaw on the floor. It's my brand. Um, so as far as Foundry side, I just need to take a second because there was a lot of like <laughs> bad opinions about Foundry side. So um, I loved Foundry side a lot. Um, something about it for me, um, I felt really immersed in the world. Um, I, I don't know if I read it at a really good time. I know some of you said that you did, felt like it was just a bad time for you. Um, but I just felt like I had the like movie soundtracks in the back of my head. There were some parts about the ending that did feel a little like really big, but I kind of liked that. Um, and I found that a lot of, there were some tropes and tropey type characters, but I felt that they were twisted a bit and made um, different, like the mad scientist type character, the um, almost like, paladin type like a lot of these things that we've seen a lot um were a little bit different for me so i really liked that and i liked some of the magic and stuff that was going on in that world um i obviously totally stand for the book of the ancestor series though as well so yeah gray sister was amazing i'm a little eh, right now spoilers for next year not spoilers for the book but um holy sister i just finished reading and so it's kind of the for me um tainted gray sister a bit i feel like because i know that i loved gray sister when i read it so gray sister also has my vote don't worry, um, not that it mattered uh, anyway. So it's not like I had any like real- Every vote counts, Sam. <laughs> Every vote counts. So but I know that Grey Sister, I think was my favorite of the whole series. Um, although like Grey Sister and Red Sister were so close for me and I just really loved them. But yeah, the, the ending of Grey Sister and everything um, was, was so, so good. And Abbas Glass is just like one of the best characters and all the things that Chelsea said about lesbian assassin nuns, I'm like, 
same. So yeah, Grey Sister definitely had to take it for me, even though all of them I love a lot. So yeah. Um, Sorry, so Sophie, we all had to choose. <laughs> Did you want to know who won? Because no, we don't. Yeah. No interest. We'll just I end really, it now. I the public choose, but I don't know if y'all heard me. So yeah, like you're all a hundred percent wrong and got it all backwards. Because <laughs> Cersei won by like quite a bit, oh. and Grey Sister was third. <gasps> yes. What the heck? What did that happen last year? Oh, I wish I'd vote it now. How are all of you so I wrong? I don't understand. <laughs> But then that was you know, wrong. You know, I did not like Grey Sister. No, I, didn't I mean, I enjoyed it, but I felt like it was just the first book again. But I don't get a say, so it's fine. <laughs> I have uh, uh, that of all of them, it was Cersei, though, because I do feel like our audience tends to lean just very sort of like epic fantasy stuff like that. We, so we we a good retelling. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Cersei does surprise me, even though it is great. Um, so yeah. Well, hopefully every single one of you that voted for Cersei goes and reads the Song of Achilles because if you haven't yet, you're fucking it's missing out because it's amazing. Than it's way better. I mean, I know that that was like way too long ago to be in this award ceremony, but like, I'm just saying, you guys should definitely go read it. It's great. Yeah, it's great. All right. Well, that is the end of award season. Um, I don't know if the audience is as exhausted as we are. <laughs> um, Round of applause for us. Yeah, we did yeah. it. Yay. 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 I hope you loved the extra month to fit in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for your patience. I think everyone kind of knows if you've been following this for a while that we do tend to tweak the dates around a bit because sometimes our lives get very overwhelming and there's just a lot of reading to do. Um, and if you guys notice, it's really hard to organize as like 10 people across several international time zones to yeah. ever do anything ever. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge. Okay. So, we are a global community here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. so, we um, thank you for being a part of it. And if you guys have any recommendations or anything, things that you'd like to see in the future as far as how it's run or anything, we always take suggestions. We might not actually implement them, but we'll take them. Um, so definitely let us know if you have any really cool ideas or anything um, that you think might help us or any um, babbles topics and things like that that you'd like to see for next year because that would help us out as well. So uh, thank you guys all for watching and thanks to my fellow judges for doing this again and See you guys next year. It'll be here before you know it. <laughs> we love it. We love it so much. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.